Welcome to our studies in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, today we'll be wrapping up this series by looking at the epistle of 3rd John. You can see the, uh, fa the uh, familiar verse that we've been using as our theme verse from John 14, 6, the Gospel of John. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so these three epistles that he has written uh, thematically uh, drop into the way, the truth, and the life. Although we'll read about them in each of the epistles, uh, they each take on one of those characteristics that Jesus spoke of. And so welcome to 3 John, and uh, let's get right into it. Here's the outline that we will use, and if you have uh, not listened to the introduction, I encourage you to go back and to do that uh, before we go much further. So first of all, I need to tell you that we're going to be meeting three different characters, individuals in the church, Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. Uh, it's like an Oreo cookie. The two on the end, Gaius and Demetrius, are good guys. Diotrephes is not the sweetness inside an Oreo cookie. In this case, it would be a lot of rot and distasteful things. And so we see duty of uh, hospitality. Then we see the danger of wanting to be number one and uh, taking actions that will uh, basically amount to that. And then we see a demonstration of humility. And so two things that we need and one we definitely do not want in our churches. And all this was going on in the church. So let's get going. And here's Gaius after some introduction here. And as it talks about opening up our homes as well as opening up our hearts. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And so he is writing to Gaius right now. And we know that the elder is uh, the Apostle John. And well-beloved means uh, in the Greek, well-esteemed. Well you, you have a name for yourself, but you didn't have to work at it. You did it by, you obtained a favorable and a beloved position in our minds and our hearts, an esteemed position because of your servitude for the Lord. And John goes on to say, whom I love in the truth. So we know he's walking in the truth. And so he goes on and says, Beloved to him, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So our first phrasing after he says, Beloved, which is an attention-getting word or a designation, in this case probably both, he says, I wish above all things. He says this, I pray above in all respects. That's how that would read in the Greek. I pray above in all respects that you may be prospering and being in good, being in good health as your soul is prospering. And so he says, because your soul, your spiritual life is, is just glowing and on fire for the Lord, my prayer is that your physical health match that and that above all things that you prosper in your life's journey, in your life. The word prosper means he's telling him to prosper in your journey of life. And that would go along with good health. Let's move on. Those are, that's a great prayer and a great statement that John would make to anybody. John goes on to say, For I rejoiced greatly. When the brethren, people of the church, came and testified, uh, and the word testify means to bore witness of, they, he, he's saying that they told me what they had seen and what they had heard of the truth that is in you. And so they come and they say, boy, that Gaius is an incredible person. We see Jesus in him. His walk in the truth is straight. And he is a dynamic Christian. And then he goes on to say, even as you walk in the truth. Now, I've written a, a phrase here that may help you understand what walking in the truth is about or walking for the Lord. 
to walk in a way that is real and genuine. Okay, that's primary. When we walk with the Lord and are walking with the Lord, it has to be real. It has to be genuine. It can't be put on. It can't be, well, I'm going to do this to impress someone else. Because the rest of that phrase says, without any phoniness or concealment. So we're walking with the Lord and we're just an open book of just serving the Lord. How can I help you? What can I do? What can I pray for you about? And so here's the character of Gaius, and we haven't finished the, all of them, but I thought I'd put this right in the middle. We already know that there's truth in him. We know that he walks in the truth. And we're going to read shortly that he's very faithful, and he has a loving heart for not just the Lord, but the people of God and things of God. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, and let me read in the Greek, it's continuous action, that my children are walking in the truth every day. I have no greater joy. And so I have one of our uh, walkaways, and I put them uh, applicable things uh, all throughout our studies as we do them. And he was just talking and calling us that my children, the, the people of the congregation, that they really are walking in the truth. Now, today, as parents or grandparents, we should find joy when our children or grandchildren are walking in the truth of God's word, which in turn, that requires us to set that example and to consistently pour God's truth into them. It's a good statement, something good to think about. Beloved, you are do faithfully, you are doing faithfully whatsoever you do to the brethren and to strangers. So let me read this as the Greek would read. He said, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. So he says you don't make a differential. If if somebody comes along and you don't know them, you, you're the same. You help out. You care. You talk about as well as much as you would do a brother that you do know. Strangers is, are actually foreigners or those who are, who are without the truth. So these could be somebody that's from another country or city, but it also could be somebody that lives in the area, but they don't know the Lord, so they're a stranger to things of God. And so he said, you, you act and you live the same and treat everybody the same. And Jesus talked about this in Matthew 25, 20. Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things, and I'll make you rule over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And verse 6. Which I have borne witness. John's still talking about what he's seen in Gaius. Of your love before the church, your charity. Whom, if you bring or send forward on their journey after a godly sort... You shall do well. You shall do well is a polite re, uh, use of a polite, re, polite request. Sorry, of just saying, you will do kindly. Wish you well. Now, I'm going to iron out the, the phrasing right here in our next verse because it continues on because, and it starts to answer, because that for his name's sake, the Lord's, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. So if we go back to verse 6, and he's talking about the charity uh, before the church whom you bring forward on their journey in a godly sort, what it's talking about is people come and visit the church, and Christians are, are walking from city to city. Maybe they have business from town to town. They, they stop in at the church, and it was the church that would have members that would put them up and feed them, and maybe if they were having a service at night, and certainly have them come to that and be part of that group. So they were open to that hospitality and that love. And if they needed, and the people that were putting up, or if the church could, they took an offering for them, or they gave them out of their pockets as they went on their, their, their ministry for the Lord onto a next spot. And Christians back then just didn't necessarily... Uh, just one person go. It was very rare. Even Paul had somebody with him most of the time. 
couple of times you'd leave him behind and he'd move on. But by this point, this is years and decades later, Christians were in groups. And they would go out in groups and uh, oftentimes the servants of the Lord would just make a trip around and let people know what's going on and see if they could help the church in some way. So that gives you an idea of the function of the church. We therefore ought, we are obligated, this goes along with what I've just said, we are therefore obligated to receive and to receive such. And is what it's talking about, therefore we're obligated to take up under in order to raise up. So think of this as you're picking up a box or a heavy, you get under it to lift it. What he's talking about this is we're obligated to just gather our visitors, our brothers and sisters in Christ that are passing by or there to help us and undergird them and raise them up and encourage them as best as we can, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And so what he's saying was you become a companion in the work of the Lord, not just in the church, but beyond. Sounds like missions work a lot, doesn't it? Sounds like people coming by that, got, that will, and their mission candidates or their missionaries already, and they share their work. We as God's people are obligated to undergird them and to pray for them. And when we send them away, we send them away better off than when they came. It's not enough to know the truth, but one must live it out in a loving way as well. And we see that. We see that exactly of what this was all about and we were looking at. All right, here's the danger of haughtiness, diatrophies. Two verses, and that's two verses too many for this. And so uh, John goes on to says, I wrote to the church, but, now it's the word but is a change of direction, but Diotrephes, his, his name means nourished by Jove, and Jove is a Roman god and of sky and thunder. And this guy has a lot of thunder in him. And it says this about Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, received us not. And so he wrote to the church, found out about it, and John was saying, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about coming, or I'm going to send somebody, and maybe some people stop by. He shut him out. He didn't respond to John's letter, nothing. And uh, the word preeminence means first position. And it expresses a, an ambition and a desire. See, what he wanted to be is number one. He wanted to run the whole show. Verse 10, wherefore, uh, John says, if I come, I will remember or I will call to memory his deeds, deeds which he does. I'm going to go on because uh, pratting against us. The word pratting means gossip or gossiping against us with malicious words. Now, the word pratting, here, here is the basis of what that is. All right, it's gossiping. So it's gossiping. All right, the word signifies this, to talk big bubbles of words. Like somebody's full of hot air, maybe. It is a metaphor taken from overseeding pots, pots that are overboiling, and it sends forth a foam or a lot of bubbles just connected together. And so that's what gossip is. Gossip's a lot of, of, of just foam, froth, bubbles that just will pop shortly thereafter. And it it contains nothing and has of no value. Got to go on, though, because it talks about malicious words. So what's the gossiping with malicious words? It's unfounded accusations is what that means. And he's not content therewith. Neither does he himself receive the brethren. He don't want anybody. And forbids, forbids them that would, those in the church, that would like to take care of people and like to minister to souls. And he casts, he drives them away out of the church. This guy needs out of the church. And if John shows up, 
he would do just that. But it was up to the church. There's just no way with the church, how it's set up, that someone like this can, can take over and not be, not be expelled out of the congregation. The people, rich or poor, need, just need to get together and say, you are no longer welcome, welcome here. You do not belong here. You do not show the, the evidence of Christ in your life. You are a troublemaker. Leave. We do not want you here. And that's, that's what churches should do. But I know, I know churches right now that um, usually this starts when they're without a pastor. Someone sees, well, this is my opportunity, and they start exercising the, an office they're in and stuff, and, and they take on more power. And I also see this when a new pastor comes that, you know, sometimes they're very, very willing to leave that guy in that position. And so that pastor never can get the leadership that he needs and that the Lord wants him to have. So let's watch our churches. And then we close with Demetrius. This is a good guy. Beloved, follow not, don't mimic that which is evil, but that which is good. And that's talking about that which helps another person. He that does good is of God, but he that does not, he, he that does evil has not seen good. Let me go back and read it how, how it should read. All right, he that is doing good, and it's continue, is of God, but he that is doing evil has not ever, ever even seen God. Okay, so these are action words that they're ongoing, they're present tenses. Demetrius has a good report of all men. His name means belonging to Ceres, and that's a Roman goddess of harvest, and it's like the love that a mother gives to a child. See, this guy has a very giving heart. Um, he has a good report of the church and of the truth itself. So he's walking in the truth, yes. And we also bear record or testimony. We know, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you. But, and here's John's desire, I trust I shall shortly see you, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to you. Our friends salute you. Greet the friends by name. I think John really in his heart wanted to come see these folks, not to just clean up a problem, but to come and just be an encourager and uh, let them know of his prayer and his love and how proud he and the Lord that he is of them. And uh, this is a short letter. They don't need to be long to express what he's done. I have a closing statement, and we'll wrap it up with this. In the world driven by technology, mobile phones, and social media, we often miss out on the joy of having a face-to-face -face conversation. And that's what John said. I want to see you face-to-face. -face. How important it is for God's people. We need the church. You can't say, I, I'm a Christian, and I, but I don't need the church. I worship the Lord where I want. That's not in the Bible. That's not right. That's wrong. We need the church. And why is that? Because we get a lot of joy and we, there's a lot of need for us to have face-to-face -face conversation with God's people, children of God. So the question I'd leave with you on the end here, uh, how's your face-to-face -face conversation going with God's people? Father, thank you so much for this epistle. As short as it may be, it's very powerful. We've actually seen a lot about the church and, and the people that have been mentioned here, about Gaius and, and Demetrius and how godly they were and how good and how they walked in the truth and solid, solid people. Yet within the congregation, there was one, that, a big, big problem. Uh, someone filled just basically full of hot air and just wants to be number one. Lord, uh, you warn us on those things, and you give us these things as encouragement as well 
as red lights. May we watch our walk, first of all, and our love for you, and may we be encouragers to your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to thank you for listening in on this teaching of 3 John, and if you joined us for all of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, God bless you for it. Here's when I, where can I be found, and you can find all the rest of the 1st John teachings and 2nd John already up on YouTube. Just check out 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the playlist. You'll find it there. God bless you, and I'll see you for the next book that we teach.